Hello, and today we are speaking to our very own Bruges Group Director, Mr. Robert Olds, on his new book, World War II, The First Culture War. It's about the Second World War, a topic many of us have learned about back to front, before and after, and a war that, needless to say, has done a great deal to shape the way we live, the way we're governed, and our understanding of the world, of states and their interactions with one another, and of Europe. It's already received endorsements from the former cabinet minister, Sir John Redwood, Rear Admiral Roger Lay Knott, um, the former Royal Navy Commander Operations and Flag Officer of Submarines, and Professor Michael Rainsborough of the Australian Military Academy and former head of the King's College London War Studies Department. In the first culture war, Robert writes that the Second World War was a clash of civilizations, of ideologies, the allies on the side of liberty and freedom against the collectivist statism of Nazi Germany and totalitarian Japan. In this book, the Second World War is more than the course of its events and its short-term impact, as we're taught. It's the big history that counts. It was a combination of factors, both large and small, that brought this conflict to life, he writes. Cultural and historic forces delivered the, death of, the deaths of millions and set in course the rise of the American and Soviet empires and the destruction of both the Third Reich and Imperial Japan, he writes in his book. So Robert, uh, congratulations on finishing the book. Thank you so much, Christopher, and thank you for all your help that you've provided. Not to worry. Um, so I guess let's get straight to it. Um, so what made you write, want to write this book and what inspired you to write this book? Um, you've already written a previous book on Field Marshal Montgomery. So why this book and why on such a broad subject? Well, the Second World War is, of course, the, in a sense, the ultimate stress test on uh, political and economic systems and uh, is also an expression of culture as well. Uh, culture essentially determines ideologies and how indeed people fight wars and when and why and where and indeed determines what happens and I realised that culture was in co course the determining factor. Much is written about the Second World War, about what happened and when. Uh, but of course, it doesn't necessarily go into the reasons of the why. Of course, you know, we understand the why in terms of German um, imperial ambitions and the uh, evils of Nazism and so forth. But that doesn't really get to the heart of the matter, which drives the actual behaviours of people and how, in a sense, the hand of history uh, was governing what many peoples did. It, uh, leaders of various nations that were the belligerents of the Second World War were governed by history and governed by the history had given them and, of course, uh, the culture that determined how they viewed events and what they did and were, in a sense, prisoners of the, these economic, cultural factors that were determining how, indeed, the war came to be and how it was fought out and how the conclusion was arguably always inevitable the continental collectivist systems could never beat the free market, uh, pro-liberty systems that had emerged really in medieval England. And I'd realised this and thought we needed to explore, in a sense, the big history of World War II and what was really happening, because there's important lessons that we can learn for this day and indeed alarming parallels between some political movements, particularly identitarian political movements, and of course, the Nazis, which of course wreaked so much havoc on the world. Um, certainly, and we'll talk about a little bit of that later. Um, and I guess starting off of, on maybe what's an area of more your expertise and it, um, relating to your experience in writing about military strategy, um, you mentioned a little bit in the conflict in strategy between the great powers at war in your book. So in your opinion, uh, what exactly was that great difference in strategy and how did it pan out um, over the course of the war? Well, Britain, um, particularly originally England, uh, went global quite some time ago and it is very separate to Europe. We speak about uh, sometimes uh, pejoratively English exceptionalism, but it exists. And Britain and England particularly are, although officially on the continent of Europe and certainly no longer in the European Union, but it developed along very different lines. Uh, English law, for instance, common law, is markedly different to the uh, continental systems. 
Napoleon, the Napoleonic Code or, or, or Roman law, which emanates uh, in uh, Byzant Byzantine Empire, as it's now, now called, it's a very different system. And of course, feudalism existed on the, on the continent and lasted for quite some considerable time. Uh, England developed different, differently, of course, feudalism was imposed briefly, but quickly unraveled, uh, as did the, the guild system. And medieval England, going back to Anglo-Saxon times, had limitations on, on monarchs, on the government, essentially, and, the, and rules by law rather than by arbitrary will of some ruler who has uh, established themselves. And this developed a very different political and economic culture in England that contrasted with that on the continent, as I mentioned. And then, of course, England took this to large parts of the world, which is now what we call the Anglosphere and something yourself, Christopher, have done a lot to uh, uh, to, to, to spread the good of, 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 uh, of how people uh, will benefit from, from an Anglosphere. And, uh, and of course, the, the focus that England should in, and Britain should develop and focus on the nations that we have in common, in common uh, of course, many of which are part of the Commonwealth. And England took those ideas abroad and they developed superior social and economic and political systems that were far more productive. We see on the uh, continent uh, that up until recently, mass production was something that was very hard for, for countries such as Germany to attain. And of course, Italy, a country that should indeed be be powering ahead they were a belligerent in the second world war um briefly fighting the uh, the allies before joining forces with with us against nazi germany when of course they were came to be occupied when they quit the second world war it, countries like italy which should be creative and indeed in, are are often stolen by a state desire to restrict free enterprise to restrict growth in their economy and just hand power to in essential monopolies and that's essentially what corporatism uh, a key component of fascism actually was it was very damaging and those systems just simply could not compete with of course that which developed in medieval england the free market and of course had its perfect or near perfect um, replication and iteration in that of the United States and the economic powerhouse that became. And America was an economic powerhouse for a reason. There's many other countries with significant land masses, significant natural resources, but they can't simply put them to work and create prosperity and create the sheer amount of economic that America can because they didn't have the free market, private enterprise principles, which are a cor cornerstone of having a good prosperous nation. And when it came to a system of Nazism that relied on plunder, just as Napoleon's forces relied on, on plunder, to compete with the profit, individual incentive, uh, the, the carrot, so to speak, would trump the Nazi stick every time. Interesting. So more than military strategy, it's ideology and styles of governance that do affect um, the outcome of the war and did affect the outcome of the war. It's a, it's a story of a uh, national development, national growth, just as much as it is military tactics, military strategy, and indeed uh, more morality and political ideology. So I think in this book, um, on the geopolitics side of things, in this book, you go deep into each power's reasons for entering the war and the internal politics in each country of that time. Uh, more than that, you discuss how factors such as geography and terrain go to the heart of what to, to the heart of uh, how the course of, of the war was affected and why they ended it in the first place. Japan, for example, you described as an island in chains, being a society that had just emerged from feudalism by the time of the pre-war years. How important do you see that as a factor in determining the war and its results? Yes, Japan, of course, was markedly different to, to the United States. It was a country that was isolated uh, and, of course, reveled in that, in that isolation. Of course, that led them to be spared many of the uh, problems that befell China when, of course, they were forced to open up uh, 
to the to the British Empire, amongst other others. They um, jealously kept their sovereignty. Indeed, it was actually an Englishman who was a uh, advisor to the uh, yes. to, to the Shogun. Actually, dominated a lot of that a lot of that policy. But Japan, in itself, was it, of course it's a victim of, of that isolation, but also a victim of its own uh, resources. It is part of the of the Pacific Ring of Fire, uh, geography, uh, topography. Um, plate tectonics had given it a great deal of natural resources, though it's very forested uh, and there is in a lot of most land is taken up for um, by, by, by trees and is not a part of a, of a city or agricultural production. The resources are there. It's resource rich. And that enabled uh, rulers to have everything they need without having to go abroad as England. England itself is very similar to Japan, uh, a series of Great Britain and the British Isles, the United Kingdom of islands. Uh, but of course, Britain didn't have the resources Japan did and had to look elsewhere for those. Uh, hence, uh, of course, uh, the, the British Empire, plus, of course, was more open. The sort of Japanese system was very closed and feudalism was allowed to continue. And that created a very different society to what existed in Britain, in the United States. And it's true to this day that Japanese society is excessively um, small c conservative and very restrictive and not necessarily open to new ideas and, any, and not open to change either didn't embrace didn't embrace that and japan became uh, backwards economically of course you know had a resplendent culture a very marked difference and unique culture that that was uh, that in many respects is incredibly beautiful but of course uh, war in the uh, industrial age a total war it was it was thoroughly unsuited to that its large population meant that its leaders could rely on on a, on a large obedient workforce rather than rely on technical innovation which is what we had to do in England particularly and, and Great Britain uh, following following the union between England and Scotland and later England uh, Scotland Great Britain and uh, Ireland Japan unified by, by force and it kept a culture in place that didn't specifically restricted social mobility. Even when um, on the rare occasions that uh, a ruler did emerge from a more humble back steps was to take measures to make sure that that could never happen again. The, the opposite was true in countries such as England or indeed the United States, where merit existed, not, not as much as it should, but of course, to a, to, a degree, to a greater degree. And Japan, of course, had a, had a culture, and we can really understand, I think, Japanese culture through its art and the contrast with uh, that culture which exists in, in Britain and, for instance, in America, and the, the, the freer nations with, with religions in the Second World War. In our country, in our culture, when we look at na the natural world, for instance, what we see is what we regard as, as things naturally exist is what we is what we would appreciate. If we were to have a, a, a scene of the, of the countryside, for instance, in a painting or photograph, it appearing natural would be what we consider to be beautiful. If there's a painting of the sea, how it appears naturally. To the, to the to the naked eye is what we would what we would consider we have a culture where our art shows us that the way things are is how 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 they should how they should be and that means we we work within the real world not just what we want it to be the japanese culture is distinctly different going back thousands of years even and things don't change within cultures george orwell would set this out which i'll come to come to in the book cultures endure uh, and just find different ways of expressing themselves. But Japan, thousands for thousands of years, if there were to be a boulder, they would rework it, for instance, to make it look more pleasing to the natural, to, to the naked eye. Whereas in our, our society, if there's a natural scene, 
we would consider it beautiful as it is. The Japanese culture wants to change things. If there are trees to this day, and I just don't mean bonsai trees, uh, if there are trees in public parks to look more attractive, of course, we would have coppice fences or pollarding for very practical reasons, but not so to the same degree of changing how they look for aesthetic reasons so people could in, enjoy them. When it comes to paintings, if there's a painting of the natural world, we know those Japanese paintings are, are essentially impressionist. They are uh, they ruined, uh, very impressionist uh, in France, for instance. But if there's a painting of the sea, it's a stylized version. And that's really a culture that wants to remake the natural world, that wants to impose its will on things rather than accepting things how they are and how they work in reality. And this came to play itself out in war. The United States, uh, it, its soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines would be adaptable. They would find ways through. They would, of course, question uh, perceived wisdom. They would question battle plans. There was the wisdom of crowds and there was people using their individual initiative. Japan came to the Second World War and thought they could impose their will because their will had been imposed by leaders there for millennia top-down feudal controls, imposing their will as expressed through art, we're going to remake the world. And they thought they could remake human nature. They thought they could change according to their will what other countries, what other peoples would do, and that they, their will would naturally impose itself on others who would then conform to what they wanted because they had been so used to making others conform that's not a culture that was dealing in the real world as we would celebrate it, as we uh, people who are politically influenced, for instance, of, of Edmund Burke, where we would be looking upon not trying to impose our will, but trying to make things work according to what would give the best, for instance, outcome. And for instance, also John, John Stuart Mill, rather than thinking of how things should be. And so Japan itself was thoroughly unsuited, both economically and also culturally, to fighting a war with a practical opponent because they would produce battle plans and thought, for instance, that the enemy would follow exactly what they wanted or they got a very big and were, you know, ground to power, essentially, uh, in the, as Winston Churchill saw what would happen and indeed, he, he was he was right. And so the, that is the perfect really example of, of the difference. And see, of course, Japan war in a uh, very, very romantic way, whereas we saw America, uh, they would mainly have war films with people such as John Wayne, uh, who, of course, when America was was losing then this this John Wayne soldier the Royal Marine uh, that he was playing was of course thoroughly invincible later he developed his roles and became more more practical it was earthy it was it was real Japan fought its war and motivated its soldiers through through culture uh, of course one thing that Japan is known for and many people still love to travel to Japan to see this is the fall of the cherry blossom uh, of course the uh, Cherry Blossom Society, which existed in Japan, uh, is was something that was very um, powerful in motivating people to go to war. And of course, the Cherry Blossom in poetry became a way of advocating uh, its young men to sacrifice their own their own lives. There was there's there was a poem uh, about how the Cherry Blossom received uh, reaches the point of perfection when it falls. And of course, that's what people go to see the cherry blossom trees for. But when the cherry blossom falls off the tree and goes to the, to the ground, and it's a beautiful sight. And they argue that um, that is when the cherry blossom receives its perfection. Of course, to fall is uh, also a euphemism for dying in, in combat. And they would argue that a soldier would reach his perfection when indeed they would fall when they would die in combat. Well, that's no way to win a modern war because of course, if you lose your young men in suicidal banzai charges, for instance, or you're sacrificing their lives, 
glorious as they may have thought that, that means they're not alive to fight again. And indeed, um, one wins modern wars not by losing your own soldiers, but by actually making the other side die for their cause. And Western democratic society that values the individual, uh, that values life, was far more suited to uh, winning a war because we, Britain and the United States did not need to, to waste the lives of its young men and in many cases women as well on pointless uh, military endeavours. They would be far more practical and the, the capitalist or the free market economic system, capitalism is a pejorative term um, developed by Karl Marx, but the free market economic system was far more practical and the democratic societies were uh, far more responsible in their use of resources and manpower than of course the um, reckless and feckless Japanese leadership at the time of the Second World War. Yes, I, um, I can see where, where you're saying, particularly when it comes to say the Japanese and during their, um, their short period of colonial rule in East Asia, during the Second World War, their, their greater cultural prosperity sphere. They, yeah, I think, but I believe they at the time, and you write about this, that they took the view that uh, this would be a war of sort of ethnic liberation and everyone would go along with their interpretation of events. Their, their long held gripes, their long held grudges about uh, alleged uh, racism and uh, discrimination that they thought they'd faced on the world stage, that the, the universe and all of East Asia would sympathize with them. That clearly was not true um, in the respect that. Uh, I highly doubt that many of those occupied countries had agreed or consented in any respect um, to Japanese rule or occupation at the time. So, of course, that uh, in itself brings up wider debates. But of course, um, culturally speaking, in terms of how uh, a nation like Japan did see the world, yes, absolutely. And I think this obviously reflects. Yes, it's, it's really world. interesting what you say about the uh, coast boss prosperity sphere of the Japanese. That was uh, a system that was essentially launched in 1942. Uh, the same year, the Germans launched what's translated as European Economic Society. Other people give it a more accurate translation of European Economic Community. And they had a vision of regional power blocks uh, that would be uh, Governing would each nation would reach each respective block and they would divide the globe accordingly. Uh, this is an idea that hasn't yet fully gone away. It's an idea that is not held by. were adopted by the, it's, it's a parasitical idea. Napoleon uh, had a similar concept of a united Europe, of course, in that France would be uh, the leader. Uh, then later when Germany and Prussia, then followed by the, the German Empire, um, became more, well, became predominant in continental Europe. They had ideas of a, of a customs union, and the idea was to insulate Europe from Anglo-Saxon uh, free market uh, ideas and the uh, worship of Mammon uh, as, as they would they they would see it um, and and fine and, and finance as well as, as especially and they would thought to create their their own structures and these have been these are this idea has persisted through time it, of course it goes back beyond um, Napoleon, uh, Dante had similar uh, concept. Uh, throughout throughout history, it finds it, it repeats, and those who are in power will adopt that ideology as a way of those who have that kind of mindset that they want to control what other nations do and have themselves as the as, as the hegemon uh, within Europe, for instance. They will then seek to use those institutions that they've created. As a, as a way of establishing their own power and of course they will justify it in terms of in terms of trade being beneficial for instance um, Germany was seeking to do the same long before the first world war trying to set up uh, various customs unions uh, which of course they would uh, they argued would benefit other countries in terms of trade and the economy but of course at the heart of it was of course interests of 
naked naked power and making sure that they were predominant and could rule over over their near abroad as they would have would have seen it and their and their neighbors and at the same time keep out the influence of England which they knew uh, is of course very very different to that uh, of the continent and to developed markedly different yes um and I guess moving on there's there's a very there's an elephant in the room here and it's something that you've discussed previously it's and it's what we call the culture war quote unquote there was a very touching set of lines there's a very touching set of lines that you write in the dedication to your son and it says uh, if i may read it out um, to viewers here it is not the states that makes a nation great it is when the government is made to let go that power and prosperity will flow so how do you think that that idea that understanding reflects on a lot of the cultural dis debates and discourse that's taking place today you talk about identitarianism um, how do you think it reflects on that well, Adam Smith, for instance, pointed out that the, the, the wealth of a nation, of course, as great Scotsman, um, part of the, the Scottish Enlightenment, which Britain helped take to, to the world, pointed out that the, the prosperity isn't about the, the amount of money that would be held by, by the monarch or, or, he, or his or her government uh, in, in, in the coffers. It's, the, it's the, the functioning economy, the wealth that we have and, and, and the trade that, that exists. Many people, of course, no doubt the, the British government at this point in time, just like every other government, could actually do with a lot more money in its own in its own coffers and has relied on, on debt far, far too much. That's a debate and a, and a discussion for another day. But at these times, we didn't have the great indebtedness of, of nations. Uh, various countries didn't have properly functioning um, economies. They had state con control. And many people favor that sometimes people are 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 very 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 wary sometimes uh they're 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 concerned but they're often it rely it comes from a belief uh, in that people shouldn't be free to act you can't you can't necessarily trust them and some people have a mindset an authoritarian mindset that seeks to control what others do or indeed at least stop others from doing what they what they would in a, a functioning free market, for instance, where people can make their own choices. To so some, that's anathema. And we've seen this throughout history, and it, and it replicates itself, and that, that attitude attaches to various ideologies. It's, uh, it's, it's at the core of fascism and Nazism and communism, which are all authoritarian collectivist systems of different, dif different shades and dif different ways of e expressing themselves with the same... Uh, the, the, and the, and as is as is feudalism indeed, but at the very heart of all those systems is a belief that people need to be kept in their place, and uh, need need to be controlled. That the state will provide, and of course, if the state provides, it can also take away at will, and indeed uh, did throughout time, especially for, for against groups who are considered outsider groups, and those systems are very unproductive they're deeply unproductive they are uh, keep people in, in in poverty they may at some point cure some problem but will create countless other issues going going forward so what i really want to show is that it's it is actually a, a free market where people can use their own individual freedom their initiative they're driven by incentment driven by inducements to perform positive inducements at that and to use their industrial industriousness and it's those kind of systems and those ideas developed really in medieval England and of course taken forward by 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 Scotland and other people from the British Isles and spread out to the rest of the world and adopted by countries such as such as Singapore or, or Hong Kong for instance before of course it uh, was um, became part of uh, China uh, the modern Chinese state those countries did very well for themselves. Those nations built themselves up on private enterprise. And some people have always found it distasteful that there's other people have a lust for, for instance, private profit. But of course, it's uh, always the other person that, 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 that's greedy and not, not oneself. There's competing cultural beliefs that think that 
people shouldn't have the opportunities to own their own their own property and we see this see this today existing in in various um social social movements that want to restrict others having the opportunity to to gain wealth for themselves uh, or, or of course even perhaps the, uh, the the world economic forum for instance and their notorious um this movie, you will own nothing and you will be happy. Um, communism is dead and statist ideas are dead, but corporatism remains. Uh, and people who want to just rig uh, the free market and try and control what others do and stop other people uh, and new entrants into an uh, into an economy having uh, have, having opportunities which they're which uh, which a rent seeking corporation, for instance, would be thoroughly exploiting. That same tendency exists. We need a culture. That would that would stop that from happening. That would stop uh, that would stop uh, the state being overly dominant. Yes. And in that uh, in that in that system, we would be be much more prosperous when we are indeed free and people are much more productive. And state companies, or corporations, nationalised industry will fail every single time. And that's exactly what they had in Nazi Germany. Their, their industry was essentially taken over, as was that of occupied Europe, taken over by uh, a state corporation and was owned then and managed by the government and by, by bureaucrats before, of course, they were put fully uh, within the German Ministry of Armaments. And it was a, it was, it was a failure, whereas the model that was pursued in Britain and America was one of private industry providing weapons in a, in a free market, having to bid for contracts. And it was the private industry that had understood things like quality control and high productivity that was actually far more productive. But if we have a government that wants to control everything, it will stifle all those things that I mentioned. It will stifle individual freedom. It will stifle... Uh, incentive it will take away positive in inducements to perform better it will take away people's industrialness it will take away their initiative so it will under it will seek to undermine competition and naturally people will and governments will think we should be in charge we we know best that's part of human nature but it is yeah. part of the story of, of these islands uh where we've repeatedly said no uh, because governments will expand themselves up until a point we say no. And, of course, that's what's happened repeatedly. Uh, of course, it happened uh, with, with rulers uh, 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 such as Edward, uh, 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 Ethelred the Unready, rather, uh, and, of course, um, uh, Thanes and the Witan saying, no, you will not be allowed to... Uh, power over us to of course the barons against king king john and repeated times in english history of the first parliament of simon de montfort for instance and, and going forward repeated repeated times uh, where english men and and indeed many times many many women as well and people throughout the british isles and in scotland as well because they they share a lot of that inheritance as well have said no we will we will take the power back and we will restrict your ability to lord over us. And that's created a far more uh, productive system that would be superior. And from that, we have a, a better war fighting machine when it came to fighting a collectivist system that didn't uh, rely on professional armed forces, that didn't rely on um, the provision of uh, food and resources, to the sector, but provide, but relied on plunder and taking from, uh, taking from the conquered, which was actually no way to have a productive economy. The Germans ruled much of Europe for a time during the Second World War, and instead of using positive incentives to make the people's work in their factories, they 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 used the whip and, of course, to rely on slave. that were produced were inadequate un, un, and un, unusable and in, and indeed the um the, the, the 
the, the Soviet Union, many of its products. Of course, the T-34 is an actual fam um, famed tank, and rightly so, but it had many, many shortcomings, and many problems had to be fixed later in the field because the production quality was in many cases so poor because they had no experience of having to produce for a com competitive market where a consumer could say, no, that's not good enough. We're not going to buy that product. Yes. Uh, and of course, what industry there was in the Soviet Union, which is, uh, which is an important point, uh, uh, that case is such as because the electricity which powered the Soviet factories were uh, from generators purchased by uh, Vickers of Manchester. Yes. Uh, in, from the United Kingdom. Its factories were, were built by uh, Americans. Its oil industry was run by Americans. This is even before, before the Second World War. Uh, in cases, many factories were bought from the United States using uh, and, and prices were, were negotiated. Factories were bought and transferred from the United States to the Soviet Union, which produced all the weapons that they rely on. That uh, there just been millions of Soviets uh, to be to be rolled over by by German armor. But it was, uh, of course, the Soviet Union also relied on. Uh, for instance, aviation oil, which was cheaper to supply via uh, the Middle East, via Britain and the United States, and then to send back to to uh, to Russia. Then, of course, it was then it was cheaper to do that than actually take it from uh, where a lot of the oil was produced in the Caspian uh, Sea and Baku, for instance. Uh, you know, just just several thousand miles uh, to, to 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 the north. And of course, Soviet uh, industrial policy was based largely on Fordism and especially Taylorism as well, which was all about serving serving the profit motive. And of course, communism was quickly abandoned in Russia, the war communist experiment that was briefly introduced by Lenin when he took power during the Russian Civil War. That was quickly abandoned and private incentive was brought to uh, by copying the West, essentially, or copying countries like Britain and America, especially, uh, such as you know, the Stukanovites and encouraging people to be more productive and giving them rewards for doing so, which is thoroughly different to Marx's conception of a communist society, which would be each according to, uh, will give according to his ability and each will uh, receive according to his need. They completely abandoned that. And in a sense, communism became just a traditional um uh expression of russian feudalism uh just an industrial form of feudalism in in uh, in, in feudal society and of course feudalism was only abolished within russia in the 1860s but before that uh, um, you know one had to work exactly where one was told by by the, by the prisons or or or, the, or 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 their equivalent of a, of a of a baron that would give them a job and they were tied to that to that position and they had to perform and, uh, accordingly. Uh, of course, they, that class was swept aside, but in its manager was was put into place and they would give someone a job and they were told what their task was and it was all top down. So and that that in a sense that's how a country like Russia has always functioned and always will function. But of course, that is just not as productive as indeed uh, what that which developed yeah. in medieval England that saw the abolition of or the undermining of guild systems and restrictive practices. And of course, America had a fantastic, you know, we talk about the, um, the, the Russian uh, industrialization and of course, they're moving industry away uh, to. To, to the eastern parts of Russia, uh, behind safe behind the Urals. Well, America had an equally uh, yes. big um, industrial reorganization, but that was based not on, uh, on on threatening people with the loss of their their own lives. They would produce factories where none had been before, and would offer people uh, incentives to go and work there, e extra pay, uh, good good schools. Um, good, good cinemas, and people would flock from across the United States to these new war factories that were that were being built, and that was done far more humanely and far more productively. And America became, of course, the the arsenal of democracy through through private initiative rather than 
rather, rather than state state controlled. And if we want countries to succeed, need to avoid that tendency that state comes over because otherwise it will be at the detriment of ordinary people with developing ideas that would be making a country successful and that's what we need to remember now i just wanted to write that in in the book explain that and that's a key part of what i wanted to write it's a message to to my son he's just at junior school uh, i think he understands uh the notion of competition and uh, striving to, to to be the best even at his young age uh, but this book i think really examines many of the, these issues uh and of course so it, you know it's the old as i mentioned it's the ultimate stress test on what makes uh, a a society function the best and what we need to, to remember and too much now you know we have a we have a we have a, a state that's taking away a lot of wealth away from people and it's not necessarily used in the most productive ways and we have many regions of indictment directives for instance many of which may be a purpose of the ultimate too many and not enough human thinking not instance for instance certainly and not enough input from real real people and the that spark of imagination that can transform a society and an economy and that's something that we have in spades uh, within the anglosphere and indeed in, in britain many noble lobbyists uh, until recently were one people for the british Isles. many thoughts and of course much of industry and ideas were developed by people in the british isles who of course were free to do so and to think and to innovate and so that's what we need to remember and that's what gave the success in the second world war and the continental collectivist systems were just unable to compete yes and i think it it's quite interesting when we look at it this way and we look at say even from the internal policies to the way that weapons were manufactured that um they did transform into real results and they did actually become more of a, a competition of ideologies, a, comp a competition of governance systems, a competition really of a carrot versus stick. Um, except, well, the, the carrot were, was came in the form of, say, as you said, cinemas, incentives, competition contracts. And uh, stick, well, um, stick was not, as, uh, gen was not as kind or generous, um, as it may suggest. So I think if we look at it from this perspective, it certainly shows um, really what, what you say by the 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 riches of, of of freedom and liberty um being brought upon the world after the second world war and um i think lastly looking at britain specifically um since of course um this is a this is a british think tank um you you write briefly about uh, pax Brit britannica and how some of these this piece um had previously been forged by british strength and british pre presence in the mediterranean sea so on a side note, do you think a similar Pax Britannica can be forged now? Ed, in world affairs, of course, it would be by if we want to be, in a sense, uh, Tim Congdon called the, the governors of uh, of. of, of of the world as we as we want to work. it's through using our imaginations and using our in inventiveness and using the skills that we have we often we talk about a country and the the assets that a country may have in terms of its natural resources for instance of course there's one thing the biggest asset is always going to be its people and this is what we need because we need a, a very good quality ed system, an education system that's built on competition uh, and uh, where, where pupils and, and schools uh, are, are competing against themselves because, of course, they will be, you know, when, as, as, when, when pupils become adults and have graduated from the education system, they will be competing with people in their own country and those from abroad as well. And we need to, to remember that. 
So we need a good quality education system, an education system that encourages people's imagination and their incentiveness and uh, their, their, their inventiveness rather, and gives them positive, an economy that gives them positive incentives to, to perform and, and benefits uh, that will accrue through their industriousness, not through, uh, not, not through being idle, for instance. This is what, 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 we, what, what is needed. And many goods will be produced abroad. Uh, that's something we have to accept. And so to move forward, it needs to be British people who would be using the skills that they have to design them, to uh, produce the technology, to uh, produce their uh, the aesthetic qualities or the ergonomics of whatever is being manufactured abroad, to then to take that wealth and use that through a, a financial industry and, and to have creative productive minds that can do the legal work to make it to make uh, other economies function and, and, and various goods and manufacturers what their what their place is in an economy because they're always going to be governed by, by by regulations we can think about a mobile phone for instance something that we're all dependent upon our on our lives yeah. um don't necessarily know well, very few of us know to know the technology behind them and how how they work of course there's also uh, they also operate within a regulatory framework. We can be working on that and deciding that, working with other countries as, as a free free nation to make sure that our vision and our technology becomes foremost within uh, other within within economies across the globe. And of course, also to to be using our, our skills for for pu public relations and, and marketing and and advertising. And this is something which really drove. Britain's success during the Second World War because we had the most creative peoples uh, on, on, on these islands being sent to the United States to pretty much influence their, their um, policy in the Second World War. And they did so uh, astoundingly and really, really were captured by some of the, the most brilliant minds in, in Britain that were sent by Winston Churchill to the United States to make sure America did exactly what he wanted. And they did for, for the most part. At, at least until at least the war the war progressed uh, but that's what britain needs to be doing and that way even though goods are necessarily being manufactured abroad they could be reworked here and value can be added and of course when there's profits going to be made then of course they can be those profits indeed can be managed and invested by institutions in the in the city of, in the city of london for instance and that requires a financial sector which which is open and a financial industry to be productive and then of course the, the accounting and the marketing and the public relations and the advertising uh, as well as the uh, the uh, the profits from the, uh, the the patents which which should exist on many of these items which will always will consistently i think be developed by by countries like britain we do have quite a strong um fintech industry already yeah. one would think uh, silicon valley dominates actually the thames valley is becoming <clears throat> predominant in terms of uh technology and that's what britain can do and we we see sort of systems emerged in uh in 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 the soviet in the soviet union or or in or in, in communist eastern europe where they just produce um the most uh, banal um, products that were of very little value and very little use to, to its citizens, but a mind, a national mindset in, in Britain where people are encouraged to be, uh, to use their imaginations and to be the absolute best that they can, will indeed mean that Britain can restore this Pax Britannica. Of course, that won't be one of, uh, won't be one of uh, gunboats and uh, the, the 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 shipping industry, which was which was so successful in spreading British power, it will be the British mindset and the asset that can be the British people, because there's none on earth that are that are like the British in a sense in terms of what they can think of and what they can what they can produce, and that just needs to be harnessed. And we need to move away from this aversion, which is uh, uh, in a sense a hangover from. Um, uh, feudal times of of, uh, of, um, of, of being first to uh, conspiracy.
breakfast consumption and of course uh, people being new nouveau victorian england victorian britain wealth creation was absolutely acceptable British industry drove forward and british technology was at the part of it it was a basic technology then using for instance just steam power when of course uh, new technology is much more sophisticated than that but at the time it was world changing as was My bad, uh, internet issue. Oh, am I still recording? So this is what we what we need. And if we were to, to be able to harness that and get people free to use their imaginations and not have them restricted by the state, then of course Britain can restore this preeminence that uh, we've lost on unfortunate adventures uh, after the Second World War in terms of nationalisation and state control, and then trying to um, hitch our, our wagon to, to that of the um, statist and corporatist uh, European Union, which has been outshone even by Antarctica in its economic growth uh, since the introduction of the Euro. Um, it's, Britain needs to go global, and Britain's instincts indeed are, are global. Uh, England itself um, was cut, shut out of continental markets um, with, with, the Re with the Reformation, uh, had less access, had to, had to explore other opportunities abroad, <clears throat> and of course always developed differently. As, as, I'd, as I'd mentioned, um, Britain's globe, Brit the British Empire, of course, now it no, though it is no longer in, in existence as, as it was once, apart from being a, a cultural empire in terms of the, um, the, the spread of the English language, spread of Anglosphere, spread of private property rights, a representative democracy, and of course, the all important common law and open source system of, of lawmaking that's incredibly adaptable and important. Mm -hmm. uh, those things um, still exist, but the Britain's tendency is to look to the to, to the wider to the wider seas to the to the rest of the world for our opportunities. And just like in 1906, when the British public voted overwhelmingly for uh, the the Liberal Party and and the option of free trade, and the same with Brexit as well, that was largely driven by a desire for sovereignty, but also underpinning that was, of course, the uh, belief in limited government uh, in terms of uh, avoiding the, the somewhat nonsensical uh, regulations that many people saw as coming from the European Union, and uh, uh, also a desire to realise that the rest of the world was could be could be open to us and focusing on just one small portion of that, relatively small portion, although important as it may be, was a was a historic mistake. So these cultural trends exist within us and they gave, they reaped its rewards in the Second World War when Britain's global network really did deliver. And we think of Britain standing alone uh, after the fall of France in 1940. Well, Britain was actually uh, stood shoulder by shoulder by uh, it, the, the sons of its, uh, of its empire from Canada, Australia and New Zealand and the millions of soldiers from India and the resources from around the world. And of course, at the start of the book, we point out, uh, we had to display a map of uh, the British Empire at its greatest extent, which meant the control of the um, oil from Middle East and much of Africa. And that all came, that all came to bear. And then of course you see small Germany, you know, small, you know where Germany is in the middle of that map that could not compete with that system, uh, 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 that, that cultural system, and of course, the geographic weight of the world which was bearing against it. And indeed, during the Battle of Britain, British plane production outstripped that of Germany. Uh, and of course, it out outstripped that of the, the Soviet Union um, as, as well. Um, you know, Britain was always in a strong position. And what's remarkable is really how the, the dominoes of Europe fell to, to Nazi Germany so quickly as a result of the Blitzkrieg, because Nazi Germany essentially could never have won the war. And they were not set up to win the war, uh, whereas British divisions were 100% uh, 
mechanized, the Nazis were still relying on cavalry and the use of horses and oxen to pull uh, their, their weapons into combat. And of course, German soldiers had to mostly had to march into battle uh, rather than be taken uh, uh, on, on trucks, for instance, or in a Bren gun carrier, or uh, as they were in the Soviet Union, relying on Studebaker trucks uh, supplied by the, United, by the United States. Germany could never compete with that system because it was a still, uh, still professes many of the, the problems that, uh, that encumbered it and, uh, to, 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 the, to, the, to this day. And we're seeing Germany after the Second World War did rebuild itself with um, order liberalism and, uh, and, and an attempt at, at, at the free market, but is steadily de-industrializing. The, the, this Germany has become itself too statist and relied on the European Union to inhibit competition and to allow rent-seeking German industry to dominate much of Europe, but it's been devoid of competition, it hasn't been functioning properly, and is in a, in a series of crises. Uh, of course, the same pattern follows where Germany was reliant on, for instance, Russian uh, or Russian controlled nat natural resources. Yes. Uh, and, uh, uh, they then sought to gain them after the, the uh, which was the Second World War was much was, 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 was largely driven by that desire, but also a cultural desire to, to uh, the clash between Teutons and Slavs, the clash between uh, the, the Roman Catholic and world and the Eastern Orthodox world, that those those battles are still continuing in a sense to 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 this day. And of course, Germany sought to rely on uh, Russian gas, for instance. Uh, that now that that adventure has um, to some degree been disrupted by the destruction of the Nord Stream pipeline. Um, mm. But of course, still very reliant on resources that come from Russia, as are many European countries. From, from Spain um, to, to Germany. And that, that, of course, has political consequences for this day. And you know, George Orwell pointed out that many of these things don't actually change. They, they just find new ways of uh, uh, expressing themselves, new iterations of them. And George Orwell pointed out that uh, the, the culture of countries doesn't necessarily change. And English culture, for instance, would, would survive and would always endure it. You can take, destroy the institutions as perhaps Tony Blair tried to do, uh, but the culture still endures. And of course, George Orwell wrote about a mindset uh, during, the, uh, during the Second World War where people were, though they didn't necessarily want Germany to win, uh, the, the mindset that took it, um, you know, the, 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 the that look, look was embarrassed to be, to be he wrote, would rather uh, steal from the poor box than uh, stand up to God save the Queen. There was a, a section that didn't want to see Britain doing well and was embarrassed when it did. Well, this is very reminiscent, isn't it? You know, we have yes. ordinary people wanting Britain to uh, excel on, on the battlefield and wanting Britain to be a success. And then we see people to this day, um, if there is good, good news, it's despite of Brexit, for instance, and don't ask, actually want Britain to be succeeding as an independent country on the world stage. Uh, and celebrating the exceptional aspects that exist in our culture and in our history as well. And that's very reminiscent to the debate about Brexit and the future yes. of this country, because there are people who, just like in the time of George Orwell during the Second World War, though they might not have wanted our European partners to actually win, they didn't necessarily like Britain being successful. They found it embarrassing. Um, well, it, we shouldn't be. We should be very proud of our of our history and the contribution that we've made to the to the world. Most notably, the defeat of continental collectivist systems and and that of its most um, virulent uh, and murderous form, that of that of Nazi Germany and its national socialist policies.
which were really very much of its time in terms of they took ideas from environmental movements, they took ideas from uh, various socialists who thought you could abolish pov poverty through eugenics. Um, many, many people who are celebrated to this day in this country were eugenists on, on, the, on, the, on the socialist side of the debate were eugenicists, or they could cure poverty in the isolation, for instance, or the or the elimination of those who were were less able. That then was adopted by by the Nazis, which they, they took these ideas, put them all together, and of course uh, Engels wrote in Karl Marx's newsletter as if there's uh, a people who are unable, unwilling to adapt to socialism, then they would be, they could be, whatever they should be, indeed, according to him, wiped out. These ideas were taken by the Nazis who had their own conception of socialism. They called it real socialism. It was a race-based socialism, that a racialist system of socialism that attributed people's um, worth and their morality and their, their, their values according to their uh, ethnic origin. And that found an expression in the... Uh, Holocaust. Yes. Uh, they took these ideas and these are anathema to English liberty, notions of English liberty and individual freedom. But these we still see today that some of these ideas are coming to the, to the fore again in the ident various identitarian movements that suggest that people, because of their ethnic backgrounds or whatever accident of birth they may, may have had or their, 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 their genetics are somehow somehow different and their values are different and their morality is different. And these ideas are being uh, expressed, expressing themselves to this day and seeks to put people into various groups. And that is something to be avoided. We should be celebrating people as individuals, yes. uh, of course, within the national framework of what we what we operate and where we can share and debate things um, uh, together in a, in a democratic setting, but we have too much reliance on, in a sense, large corporations and, and vested interests, putting people into, into groups uh, of which they're then meant to conform as they, are, as they are told to by whoever is wielding power at that time. This is concerning and needs to be avoided. It will damage our society, but of course it can also create uh, political movements such as the Nazis who brought such havoc and although the Nazis have been largely uh, dis destroyed uh, they were they were destroyed in the great conflagration which came to follow and the destruction and then the trials that they endured after the second world war where some perhaps not 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 received received justice at Nuremberg of course many escaped that but some of these ideas still persist the idea of centralizing Europe, centralizing power, and at the same time thinking that people belong uh, there uh, in various groups and are valued uh, and have values according to, to that group. That's dangerous, and that's something we need to avoid, and we need to put a stop to it now. Absolutely. And I think if we if we look at the respective war papers that, we have, that we've got over here, it, uh, I think it communicates quite a bit about the, the sacrifices, um, the the sacrifices to death, the suffering of a lot of people during the Second World War, and it's, and of course, never again, we can say many, many times, but really, it's a question of ideology, it's a question of how we choose to govern ourselves, of how we choose to live, and more importantly, how our governments choose to lead us. And it's the, the power of human liberty, and the power of human, the freedom of choice and innovation, that is really going to bring us forward away from a lot of the suffering that we all know took place during the Second World War, um, and I think this book, it's, uh, it's available digitally, it's available on paperback, um, as you can see over here. Um, so yeah, um, thank you very much for speaking to us. Um, Robert, always great to have you. Thank you, Christopher. Great to, great to talk with you about it. And uh, I hope readers will be interested in, uh, in how I explore the Second World War and show the events, what happened, and put them into the true light of their cultural context. And we look at the great battles, the strategies, what happened and when, but explain the why as well. And I think that's fascinating. I think there's a lot that we can learn 
from that in this day and uh, look forward to, to the world discovering um, World War II, the first culture war. Certainly. Thank you.